Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be covering some of the key concepts of Chapter 10 Object-Oriented Programming. Before we get started, I want to urge the Programming Logic students that are going to be watching these videos to have some patience with object-oriented programming. It is a bit of a mental hurdle, so if you've you know, started reading the chapter, read the chapter, and found it a little overwhelming with terminology and new concepts, you're not alone. Uh, there is a lot there, but it's definitely worth the time investment. Um, our objective this week is really just to explore what object-oriented programming is, to get the main ideas of it. We won't be programming in Visual Basic for object-oriented programming, but it is a concept very important to future coursework. So object-oriented programming, also called OOP, is a model that focuses on data and objects and the methods used to manipulate them. So unlike some of our previous programs where maybe we didn't do an awful lot with data, object-oriented programming is often linked with the discussion of databases because databases are a way for us to store data persistently in a, in a persistent manner so that we can go back and retrieve that data later. So in this course, you know, we usually get the data from the user, we use it in our program and program ends and data goes away. Um, I urge you when we're talking about some of these examples to think that maybe that data after we get it from the user could be saved to a database, for example. Okay, so it's just a consideration. So object-oriented programming, another thing that's important to understand is it doesn't replace anything that we've previously learned. So the previous concepts that we've learned, we're going to call procedural programming. Procedural means, you know, so we have variables, um, we have structures. Object-oriented programming does not replace that, but it's just another layer of programming that we can use. So some of the terminology you may have even heard some of these words because they're so prevalent in discussions with um, programmers. Classes, objects, polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. So there, there are some mouthfuls in there and we'll talk about each one of them. But I do urge you definitely to read the chapter this week as it explains them in more detail. Actually, not going to start by talking about classes. I really want to talk about objects first and kind of circle back to what a class is. So we interact with objects every day. So I'm sitting at a laptop right now and I'm sitting on a chair. Both my computer and my chair are objects. They have attributes, they have, in other words, properties. You know, the chair is black, for example. And they also um, have things that they can do. They have functionality. So we interact with these objects every day. So the concept of object-oriented programming is to create a programming paradigm where in our programming code, we're actually interacting with objects in our software. So remember, software is just a packaged name for programs. So for example, I worked at a hospital, so I frequently go back to hospital examples. At a hospital, uh, they use software to keep track of all their patients and their physicians and their events, such as, you know, the patient came in on said day and, and so forth. And a hospital is a good one to pick because there's a ton of data um, floating around about patients, physicians, and, and uh, you know, events like coming to the hospital. They were called visits, for example. And that data has to be organized. So object-oriented programming seeks to solve that problem. It creates what are called objects that encapsulate properties that go together. So I might create software for a hospital and in my software create physician objects, in other words, doctor objects, patient objects, and um, whether I call it, maybe I'll call it visits, I previously said events, visit objects. And 
These objects have attributes and methods. So let me pick on patients, for example. The attribute of a patient is their date of birth, social security number, medical record number, blood type. And you could go on and on with this list. And when I say methods, what that means is those are typically um, just procedures. We've learned what procedures are, you know, blocks of code that accomplish something. Um, we're going to call them methods because procedures that are part of a class are called methods. And um, this is how we can interact with the object. So, for example, patient objects, we should be able to register the patient, discharge the patient. Basically, think of all the activities that your program would want to be able to do to a patient object. And those are the methods. So we create these objects in our code and then we interact with them. So how are objects created to begin with? That's where the class comes in. A class describes a group or collection of objects with um, the same attributes. So I would create a patient class in my code. I would create it. I would define what kind of attributes it has, date of birth, social security number, um, which end up really just being variables inside of that class. And I would decide which methods um, that patient class should have, register patient, discharge patient, and so forth. Now here's the key, once you create a class, you can create as many objects of that type as you want. So if I create a patient class, I can create 100 patient objects in my code and interact with them, for example. So that's the idea. Um, the class is often called a blueprint because it, it defines what objects of that type should have and can do. So another example would be Let's say I work in a veterinary clinic. I want to create software to manage um, my patients there, my, my furry friends. So I might create a class name called dog. And the kind of information I want to collect about dogs, of course, this is overly simplified, but name, age, and whether they've had shots. And then I, might, I often want methods to be able to manipulate those attributes such as change the name or update whether it's had shots or not. So those are things that we want to be able to do to that object. Remember, um, let the object do to itself, well, as we'll see technically is what it's doing. So we'll get to that, but um, those are the attributes and methods of class dog. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a second here because um, I've already described really what attributes and methods are. On the left-hand side, you can see the class description. Classes have a name, dog. It has attributes. By the way, we also call these fields, or a little bit later we'll see the term instance variables. And it's basically saying all dogs have a name, age, and whether or not they've had shots and we need a method to change the name and to update shots. So once we create a class in programming code, we can then in programming code create instances of that class or what we call objects. So I can create an object named Spike, who's four years old, who's had its shots, as well as an object named Brutus, who's seven years old, who hasn't had his shots. So that's the idea. Now that's just two instances but imagine the power of this. If I were reading in, if for those of you that are familiar with databases, I could read in an entire table of um, furry friends <laughs> into um, a, a collection of dog objects and instantly um, read from that database and create 100 dog objects and display them in a table for somebody sitting at a desk and scrolling through the medical records of all the dogs at the veterinary clinic. So it's very powerful. So we want to start thinking in an object-oriented manner where uh, in our code we may have the opportunity to think of things as an object um, and, and also that every object is a member of a class. So it's an is-a relationship. So my oak desk with the scratch on top 
is an object of type desk. So in that case, my oak desk would be the object, the class would be desk. So as I mentioned, the real power of this is class reusability. You define in programming code a class, and then from it you can instantiate, in other words, create multiple instances of that class. Those are called objects. Now, each class, when you define those attributes, let's go back here for a second to our definition. We have attributes name, age, and has shots. Those are also called um, instance variables. When every object of that type has their own value, um, these are often called fields. So what I mean by that is even though class has a name and both Spike and Brutus, the class dog, sorry, has a name. Even though Sp Spike and Brutus um, both have a name, if you notice their value for their name, of course, is different. So what that means is every object has a copy of its own variable. So they each have a copy of, or I'm sorry, they each have a variable called name and a variable called age and a variable called has shots. So those are called instance variables because there's a variable for every instance, um, every object instance. So a state is really just a set of all the values or contents of a class's object at a particular time. So Spike was four years old and had his shots. That is the state of that object. So because every object is created from the same code base, from the same class, they each have their um, they each have the same methods. So remember, method is um, basically a block of code that often um, updates something within the object, such as one of the attributes, or gets uh, reads a value of an attribute. But basically, they're things that that object can do. So we can create our own class, um, but to test it out, we need to have a program or another class that uses this new class we wrote. So in other words, if I create a um, class called dog, which is going to serve as our blueprint for every object of type dog, then I need to be able to test it out. So I would fire up some console application, for example, um, in Visual Studio and create an object of type dog. So in that case, my console application would be my um, class client. In other words, I'm just using this pre-written um, class by instantiating objects. Polymorphism. Oh, so basically our author would like us to call attention to the fact that the world is full of objects, right? So, you know, a door is an object that can be opened or closed, but if you think of the word open and the steps involved and what open means to different objects, opening a door, opening a drawer, opening your eyes, for example, all really have different um, meanings because, well, opening your eyes is clearly a different action. Um, than opening a file. So open procedure can open anything if it gets the correct arguments, um, but just understand that it works differently on different objects. So we may have methods that have the same name, um, but one method is defined in, you know, class dog, and another method is defined in class cat. And that method may have a different set of statements in each class. So that's all they're getting at here with polymorphism. So again, here's a picture. Polymorphism occurs when the same method name works appropriately for different types of objects. Inheritance, this is a biggie. Um, so we've talked about the fact that you know we create a class it gives us an opportunity for code reuse because we can define a class and from it multiple objects of that type can be created but inheritance 
refers to the fact that not only can you define a class from which many objects are created, you could create two classes and say that one class is a subclass of another. And a subclass inherits, inherits all the attributes, remember those are also called um, instance variables or fields, a subclass inherits all the attributes and methods from its parent class and can add its own attributes and methods too. Extremely powerful. So you can do this with your own class or even create a subclass of a predefined class, like one that is part of uh, the libraries of the .NET framework. So if you create a subclass, you say, okay, I'm creating my new class and it inherits from, and then you name another class. That class you're creating instantly has access to all the same attributes and methods um, available. Plus, you can add new traits and new methods um, for your subclass. So this isn't even limited to two levels. I used a level of parent class and subclass, this class that inherits um, from the parent class. But this could be many, many levels, and typically is. You can have um, many different layers of subclasses. So talk about code reuse. It's an extremely powerful feature. Um, inheritance is a big player in the um, success of object-oriented programming. Encapsulation, we've seen that term before. It's just in this context talking about the fact that since an object um, can is a container really for all the attributes and methods and, and they're put together in this single package. We refer to that as encapsulating um, or using encapsulation. It's also information hiding. Other classes should not be interacting directly with um, another object's attributes. Actually, to be technical about that, other objects should not alter another object's attributes in code. Um, we're going to see that there's a way that objects can talk to each other, um, but we're going to see that really those attributes for an object are protected and contained inside of that object, and that object has all the control over, um, for example, updating a patient name or updating the um, patient's social security number.